It was the second to last night at my camp. This night and the next were usually reserved for this thing called a shepherd watch. It was a Christian camp, which is where the kids and counsellors take shifts through the night to watch the fire and such, just like shepherds did with their sheep. This night, my watch was from 11pm to 1am, and I wasn't really dreading it, as I'm used to staying up late anyway. So, to give you a visual for my location, the camp is located on a lake and a small mountain. The mess hall, main office, and other buildings are down at road level, and the cabins are up on the mountains spaced apart from each other. The youngest kids got the cabins closest to the bottom, and the older kids got the further ones. I was a sophomore in high school at the time, and so my campsite was a little past halfway up. Another thing you have to understand is that the camp is in the woods. You have to drive off the main turnpike down a dirt road for two miles before you actually get to camp. So as you imagine, we were surrounded by wildlife and lots of it. It's about 7pm and the sun is just about to go down and my group of campers and another group we're down at the family camp, which is meant for the daycare service people, for little kids, or a place to bring tents and camp out with your family, as it wasn't just a summer camp. It's a big open meadow with a large picnic area in the centre. We were playing manhunt, which is kind of like hide and seek mixed with tag, and me and my friend Dom were way off in the woods, probably a lot further than we needed to be really, when we started to hear what sounded like dozens of footsteps. The faint barks and howls confirmed my guess that it was a pack of coyotes roaming around this area. Needless to say, we were a little nervous, but I had been out in the woods enough times to know that they wouldn't really bother us unless provoked or rabid and since they were in a pack, that ruled out the latter. We started to jog back towards the camp, when out of nowhere chaos explodes behind us. The pack had encountered something that it either attacked, or attacked it. We froze in our tracks and listened to the sound of yelping, barking, growling and howling, followed by the sound of flesh being ripped off something. The entire camp could no doubt hear what was going on just outside the play area, where dozens of kids are roaming around. So the counsellors decided it would be a perfect time to blow their emergency whistles and get all the kids away from the snarling, bloodthirsty canines, just a few hundred yards away from me and Dom. While the two of us were sprinting through the woods trying to get back to safety, I swear that I could hear something coming up from behind us. Not only that, but I could feel something behind us. I didn't dare turn around to check, for fear of tripping over a stick or root, and letting whatever was behind us catch up. I just screamed to run faster, and we eventually made it out of the tree line and back to the group. I asked Dom if he saw anything behind us. He says that he didn't see anything, but definitely felt something there. Later that night, the two groups, including mine, made their way up to a big fire pit, complete with rudimentary benches fashioned from logs and put into a half circle around the fire pit. It even had its own cabins, if the camp had more programs running for kids there. The campers were tasked with gathering firewood for an all-nighter, so everyone was out in the dark woods with nothing but a flashlight, and hopefully a buddy carrying armloads of firewood. I was more or less self-appointed to making the actual fire, mostly because I make huge fires, and I started with a simple small log cabin style build, and slowly built outwards from it until I was using sticks that were about 5 feet in length, and 5 to 6 inches in diameter. So it was pretty impressive, maybe a little too massive. 
While all of this was going on, I couldn't stop thinking of what had happened earlier, and every time I thought about when we felt as if something were chasing us, my heart would start thumping, and I would feel as though the creature were right behind me. At around 9pm, I heard the coyote pack again. I've heard many packs and single dogs howling, but I have never heard a pack like this. It was full of anger and hate. It was spewed forth into the night air like they were on a mission to kill. They had an objective, and nothing was going to stand in their way. It started out from what sounded like a few miles away, possibly on a neighbouring peak. The thing is, coyotes travel fast. I alerted one of the senior counsellors, saying that we shouldn't do a shepherd watch because the pack is still around here. He tells me not to worry, that they won't come near us and that they're miles apart. I really wish that were true. All the kids started singing camp songs and telling stories. I was sitting on a log, staring into the forest at about 9.45, when I heard them again, but this time they were closer. By 10.30 everyone is done singing songs and making s'mores, and they just head off to their cabins for the night, and the group that had the 11 to 1 watch just decided to stay by the flames. The group of me, Dom, and Ashley, who was a girl from our cabin, and two girls and a boy from another camp group, I think his name was Dimitri. Dom gets up to grab more firewood from the ever-dwindling supply. As he gets to the pile, he leaps backwards and falls to the ground, yelping in terror. I spring up and run over to him, flashlight in hand, and I see it. It's a baby deer, or rather, the head of one. I can assure you that it wasn't there earlier, due to the fact that the pile had been trampled all over throughout the night, and as more kids had been collecting wood. Even more so, due to the fact that the blood was still oozing from its freshly torn neck. Whatever had done this was most certainly not a coyote. There was a ping pong ball sized wound right above the ripping point of the neck of the ill fated fawn, so I guess that thing was very, very big indeed. I dragged Dom to his feet and pushed him back towards the fire circle, screaming at the counsellor that we needed to leave now, or else we wouldn't make it through the night. I knew this was dramatic, but I was distressed at the time, so bear with me. And as I'm about to start putting the fire out, I see them, dozens of pairs of eyes running all around, just on the light's edge, poised to strike. All sounds stop. All I hear is the deafening silence as fear courses through me. I have never been more scared in my life, but somehow I manage to run to the woodpile and grab an armful of firewood and throw it onto the fire. I tell everyone to grab their stuff and go, and tell them to run into the cabin that was there. Grab a stick that looks strong, but lightweight enough to swing, and run after the rest of the group. As I'm about to start stepping up onto the steps of the cabin, I hear the sound of something running towards me. Without thinking, I turn around and swing at whatever it was, just narrowly missing its head. In the dim moonlight, and the stretching arms of the firelight, I saw that it wasn't a coyote, and I honestly don't know to this day what it was. I hope what I saw wasn't real, and that it was just a trick of the light. Deep down though, I think I know what I saw, but there are some things that I might just rather forget. I've always lived in the countryside, and still do. When I was younger, me and my two sisters would often play in the woods behind our house. We had this huge area to roam around in. And as we lived very isolated, we'd never seen anyone there before, but us. This meant we could roam around to our heart's content. Build forts, biking trails, whatever we wanted. This was our nature playground. Our parents 
would always be able to shout and we'd come, as we'd never venture far, although these woods did extend very far indeed. There were a few occasions when we thought we would hike deeper to see what we would find, but for the most part, all that we would encounter would be more and more trees. However, one time, my sister opted for us to go a different route, sort of to the left of where our house was. We filled up our bags with snacks and water and went on our way. That's when we made it to a seemingly forgotten graveyard. This graveyard was nestled in the woods. Any fences that had been there had long eroded away or collapsed, maybe even the metal stolen. But the graves were there and visible, some completely covered in ivy and other plant life. We started looking around, taking the plants off some of the graves, seeing if it were possible to read any of the names. Most of them we couldn't make out, not even the dates, but a few which I can no longer remember were still barely legible. My sister had an idea that if we got some crayons and some paper, we might be able to trace the names, but we never did. However, after going to that part of the woods, did strange things start to happen? Now, remember, as I said, this was a very, very isolated place, and we'd never seen anyone here before. We'd start going out, doing our regular stuff, like go to our bike trail, and someone would have knocked over all of our cones. That'd be strange. My sisters just assumed it was the wind. On another occasion, our fort, which we had taken years building up, made of sticks and stuff, had been completely destroyed. All the sticks pulled apart and left on a pile on the floor. We couldn't explain this one away. My dad had been angry with us for staying out far too late in the forest, and so we went to confront him about it, accusing him of doing this. He gave us a quizzical look, and said he didn't even know where our fault was, and resumed working in his office. This freaked us out. But we tried to put it to the back of our minds, and saw this as an opportunity to try and build the fort again. That's when things escalated. It was summer, and so we were usually out back playing until the sun was going down. As we were walking home one night, with about three minutes until we reached our back door, did we hear footsteps behind us. All three of us instantly turn around. This is the first time we've ever heard anyone here before other than us. And we look. There's no one. We carry on walking, and about 15 seconds later, the footsteps resume, but they're at the same distance that they were before. We turn around. No one's there. And then, when we look forward back to our house, do we instantly see an apparition. The figure of a young girl. She was transparent, and skipped away through the woods. Our eyes all tried to follow her movements, but she passed a tree and could not be seen again. She never emerged past it. We all screamed and ran all the way home. All of us were babbling to my mother about what we had seen, and she wasn't able to calm us down for about 20 minutes or get words out of us as to what we saw. When we finally were able to explain, each of us told our account that we had seen a girl skipping in the forest and that she went behind a tree and disappeared. One of my sisters even said that as we were running, she looked at the tree that she'd skipped past and that she definitely wasn't there. We were all in meltdown mode. My mother, bless her, tried her best to convince us that she believed us, but I know deep down she didn't. I only, in later life, realised 
why we may have seen what we did. Could it have been that we disturbed her grave? Or by visiting the grave, had we encouraged her to come out and play? We didn't go out for the rest of the summer. We played indoors and in the garden. But after winter and when spring rolled around, did we start braving the woods again? We never saw an apparition like that again, but it wouldn't be uncommon for us to hear things while playing. Probably the scariest, besides the apparition of course, was the time that we heard laughter coming from all around us, seemingly every direction of the forest infested by this childish giggling, which caused us to run home. Knowing our parents didn't believe, we simply didn't tell them about it. We're all grown up now, but when the three of us meet up, we often talk about our experiences growing up and contemplate what it could have been that was haunting our forest. A little girl or something more sinister. We may never know, but that's good enough for me. When I went back to my parents' house, I took a walk through the woods and it turns out the graveyard is still there. I mean, it wasn't going anywhere. But what I find most curious of all is that when I told my parents about it, they didn't even know it existed, and it had only been a 15 minute walk away from their property, at most. Creepy stuff. This didn't happen to me, but to both of my parents. My mum was a teenager, and was at the lake with her family. She was around, 17. Her brother of two years younger, their two cousins, and their two St. Bernards were there also. They were all walking along a paved path in a campground type area. The dogs suddenly started losing their mind, trying to run back the way they came, which was in the opposite direction from the cabin, but they wouldn't leave my mum and uncle. They weren't on leashes, but one of them actually bit my mum's shorts and began pulling her backwards like a bad comedy movie. That was totally unusual behavior as both dogs were extremely loyal and rather protective, but were generally pretty chill and friendly. They were all just standing around and laughing at the dog's weird behavior not understanding what was going on. Then my mum says it seemed like they all looked up at the exact same moment. One of the dogs started to whimper and cower like it was absolutely terrified. All four of them looked up at the trees to the right of the trail in front of them and saw a Bigfoot. It was extremely close. This was near dusk. It was maybe eight yards away and mind blowingly huge. My mum guessed it was anywhere between eight to 10 feet. And all four of them are adamant to this day that it was nothing like a bear and nothing else it could be compared to. The creature was staring at them just inside the tree line as it crouched down when they looked. Not like it was trying to hide or about to pounce. My mum said it was almost like a person who was trying to greet a dog that was shy. The moment was really brief. Then it straightened up and crossed the path into the trees on the other side, eyeballing them the whole way. My mum says it didn't put off any antagonistic or threatening vibes, more just wary and almost forced casual. Nothing to see here move along. Not that that stopped my mother and co from being absolutely terrified. As soon as they unfroze and coaxed the dogs to carry on, they all booked it back to the cabin. When they told everyone about it, some of the others, a few of her uncles, her other brother and another cousin went back around to look. The dogs absolutely refused to go near that path though and would freak out whenever my mum or her siblings tried to go in that direction again for the rest of the weekend. My mum is an extremely rational person, 
and doesn't believe in supernatural things generally. And she is not a person who ever exaggerates or bends the truth. So there really isn't anyone I would trust more in a first hand account like this. Now, my dad, not as honest and grounded as my mum, but with his own strong moral code about some things, and also not an exaggerator nor a liar. He is an alcoholic, so he did lie about stuff all the time. But he isn't the type to make up stories like this. My dad was an avid outdoorsman. And this took place before his alcoholism surfaced. There are few people as well versed about the area as him. He knows the woods, the animals, the weather and the vegetation. And he can calmly identify the screams of cougars, dying rabbits, or deer, all the native birds, and anything else that one might hear in the woods around here. He is also a very calm, unflappable person. I remember a time when I was around 10, when we were out hunting, and he calmly pointed out a cougar that had been stalking us for several miles. It took me forever to spot it even with him describing its location. After that, he forced me to continue on, rationally explaining the cat's behaviour in a regular level of speaking tone, knowing we weren't going to come across any deer. Anyway, about 15 years ago, my dad was hunting one of his usual areas. He was alone, which was typical for him. He was about four miles in from the logging road where he parked, and the sun had just barely come up. He was heading towards a creek that was always kind of the central starting point that he and we used when hunting that area. He was wandering around, looking for a sign and finding absolutely nothing recent, which is very unusual in this area. When he heard what he described as the most utterly terrifying noise he's ever encountered. Not having heard it myself, I might not be describing it accurately. But from what I remember, he said, it was multi-tonal, as if two to three voices of varying pitches were screaming in disharmonic unison. If they hadn't gone up and down in pitch and started and ended simultaneously, he would have thought that there were several different voices. Every hair on his body stood on end, and he said he was overcome with a horrifying feeling of dread. The voice? He said that it had individual pitches that were rather human-like, and it screamed for longer than any human lungs could sustain. He estimated well over a minute and it did not pause, nor did it happen again when it ended. And that the way the sound reverberated gave him the impression it came from very far away, but given the ear, splitting volume that didn't make total sense either. Anyway, he decided to get the hell out of there. The conundrum he faced was that the sound came from the same general direction as his truck. He told me that he rationalised that he would rather be found torn to bits by some mythical beast than die embarrassingly from getting lost in the woods, as it may happen if he went in the other direction. But also part of him was afraid he was misreading something, and that it was the sound of an animal in pain, which he couldn't stand the idea of, and if he did come across it, he could either help it or put it out of its misery. The last thing he told himself before heading back to his truck is that if it was a hunting cry, the animal who made it was most likely sprinting in another direction, and unless it ran into him and his point thirty head on, they would probably not meet. So he headed back. He sprinted noisily, figuring that there were more of whatever that was out there, and that they already knew he was there anyway. He said he carried his rifle rather than slinging it on his back as he normally would have, rounded a chamber and safety off. This, more than anything, is a testament to his fear. My dad was the biggest gun safety advocate I've ever met, and I'm a hunter safety instructor, so that's saying something. About a mile from his truck, he came across an area I picture a clearing, but I can't remember what he said, that smelled horrific. 
I remember him saying it was a mix of garbage and decay, and several other things as well. He was covering his nose with his shirt to get through, and he came across a pile of extremely fresh deer guts. That wasn't the sound of the smell that he would have known, but he said they were in a pretty neat pile, and it was at least two animals worth. It was guts and legs that looked to be almost torn off, not cuts, but no head or carcasses or pelts or anything. There was a good amount of blood smeared around, but no puddle, as would be typical of an animal that bled out by another hunter. He said that he took a little while while looking around, as he's a passionate anti-poacher, and was looking for evidence about what was going on. But that's about the time that his brain clicked, and came to the conclusion that he may have interrupted Bigfoot's lunch, so he broke the hell out of there. He got to his truck, and didn't take his pack off or even buckle up until he was off the mountain. I remember listening to him telling me and my brother the story, when we got home from school that day, and being baffled. This all started when I left college. After getting my degree in journalism, I found my prospects of employment very slim indeed. I've always been quite a homely girl, and have never really liked being too far from my parents, being an only child. However, I knew that in order to find employment, I would have to brave the world and leave for one of the big cities near my small local town, probably moving there full time. So I sent out a bunch of resumes and got nothing back. I knew I would have to try harder. But it was summer, I'd recently graduated, and thought I'd enjoy my final summer of freedom before starting work in the adult world. My parents have always had a close family friend called Ray, who owns a big camping spot in the woods. They needed counsellors for the children going camping, and seeing as I'd been camping there many times in the past, I volunteered my services. The pay was okay, and the work was only for a few weeks, and would definitely be enough to keep me going doing nothing all summer. Just to give me time to send out resumes and chill with the girls. You know, the usual. So, I called him up, and within two days, my stuff had been packed up, and I was ready to drive myself down to the camp. This was the first time that I had done the drive myself. I realised it was a lot longer when you had to do the drive, instead of just play your Nintendo in the back. But, still, it wasn't that bad. I arrived, set up myself in one of the dorms with some of the other counsellors, and introduced myself. The children wouldn't be arriving for a few more days. They ran through some trainings with me, and we all got to know each other pretty well. The person who I got along best with was called Beth. She was studying at one of the local universities, and told me all about her course, psychology, and we really struck a chord with each other, and tried to keep our groups together during the camping sessions. But anyway, cut to a few weeks ahead. My troop and I are going on a little walk in the woods, and just chit-chatting as we go along. We're making our way to one of the den areas, when suddenly one of the quieter girls of the group pipes up, and asks if anyone's had trouble sleeping. Now, it's not uncommon for campers to have trouble sleeping out here. Number one, because they miss their parents, or because they're simply not used to or familiar with sleeping in tents. So, for me, it was a very normal thing to say. I bring her to my side, and tell her that it's perfectly normal, explain what I just told you guys, and try and ease her down a little bit, and explain that it was all good. But she shakes her head, and tells me that it was for none of those reasons that she feels a bit uncomfortable, and had trouble sleeping. 
She told me it's because of the running at night. I give her a furrowed brow and ask her what she meant. She says that every other night since she's been here, so roughly four days, she's been woken up in the middle of the night by someone running. I found this very odd. I told her that there shouldn't be anyone out, but that if she wanted, I would stay out with her until she fell asleep, just to make sure that there was no one around. She agreed. That night, I stayed out. I made sure my campers were asleep, I was around the fire, and just cooking some marshmallows myself, chatting with Beth, my other counsellor, and seeing if anything spooky would happen. I really doubted anything would happen, and nothing did, for the first hour. At this point I was getting tired, we were both getting bored, and our little marshmallow bag had run out painfully about half an hour ago, and we were just sitting there, poking the dying embers of our fire, with topics for conversation slowly dying out. Just as we decided to put the fire out, and make our way back, to our own sleeping quarters, did we hear something in the forest? The sound of footsteps. I tell Beth to be quiet, and we look around. We can't see anything. There's still a fair bit of light from other campfires that are dying down as well. I look around, still nothing. So we make our way back quietly, keep looking over our shoulder. I get changed into my pyjamas, and I'm about to fall asleep, but this thing is still bothering me. I still can't make out why I'm feeling so uncomfortable. I was sure that it was just an animal. So I put my shoes back on in my pyjamas, and slowly creep outside. I'm just trying to make everything out in the dark, as I don't want to be seen or heard, and I sit behind a tree and there's just enough light to make out a few shapes in the distance, all stationary so I know they're trees as well. While I wait, in the silence of darkness, do I hear something again, rustling further down. I wait patiently, seeing if whatever is there will emerge from the trees exposing itself. Would it be a person or an animal? My cell phone was in my pocket, just waiting to dial the cops. It felt like an eternity, but there was no movement, and I was very close to giving up, when before long, I saw it. My phone at this point was in hand, waiting to press the power button to call the cops. But what I saw, I have no words for. This thing, hairy, humanoid creature emerged from behind a tree. Only for a split second was it stationary, as it pushed off the ground with its legs and ran at very high speeds. It ran so quickly through the woods, I barely had time to glimpse at it for more than a second. It was tall incredibly tall, far too tall to be normal. It made very little sound as it ran, as it passed my campers and ran deep into the forest. I tried following it with my eyes, but it was too fast. And after a few minutes had passed, and I'd regained my composure, did I walk up to the tents of my campers. The girl from earlier who was scared was already out of her tent and asked if I'd heard it. I told her that I had, but did not tell her what I had seen. I just said it was a deer, and to go back to sleep, and she gave me a weird look, and crawled back into her tent, to, I assume, fall asleep. I didn't sleep that night, and I didn't do a good job with the troop the next day. I really didn't want to stay much longer after that. I didn't want to see or hear that creature again, so I made no effort to stay out longer than I needed to, and tried to pass out before the time I suspected it would be out. Fortunately for me, 
I never saw or heard it again, and I couldn't have been happier to escape those woods and go back to civilization after those few weeks. I haven't been camping since, and never intend to do so again. I never did figure out what it was, but I think perhaps it's better that way. My brother-in-law was hunting in the hill countryside outside of Austin as a teen. He was watching for an area of deer. There was a clearing with some rocks, and it was early morning, so it was pretty dark. He could mostly see silhouettes. At some point, one of the rocks stood upright and walked away. Turns out it wasn't a rock. He to this day believes it was a Sasquatch. He said it made him absolutely crap his pants. He also acknowledged it could have been some crazy homeless guy living in the woods. You know, given that Austin wasn't that far away. My house is on the biggest chunk of property in the tri-state area, about 108 acres, and was originally kind of a park, but wasn't supposed to be used as a park. Unfortunately, people from all over didn't get the memo that we had moved in, and therefore continued to party, hunt, and fish whenever they felt like it. Over the years, these problems began to go away, except for a couple. Before we talk about the perpetrators, or at least the leader, we should discuss what was behind the property. An asylum. Mostly housing psychopaths, schizophrenics, and those who have suffered mental breakdowns. It isn't rare to hear random screaming for no reason coming from over there. There were four men who kept coming back and hunting in the middle of the night. We let some people hunt in the night on Saturday nights, but for the most part hunting was off limits. We were never able to catch these four middle-aged men who always wore masks. I mention that because their leader wore a creative mask, an especially frightening kind of mask. Most of the time, he bore a pig mask. These men were sneaky, they were smart, and that's what made them scary. I had three encounters with them, the first being in June of last year. A few friends and I had decided to go on an adventure through the woods, and we discovered something frightening. We had a fortress covered in beer cans with a chair at the top. Being the teenagers we were, we decided the smartest thing to do was to destroy all of the hunter's hard work by kicking the entire fortress down. Boy, did we mess up. We later returned to that fortress to check up on it, and that's when it got scary. It was rebuilt almost as a shrine to the last one, and spray painted around it was, try that again, we dare you. The second encounter happened during a simple walk at night. Sometimes when I get upset, I like to take walks through the woods. This time was at night, and it just so happened our favourite hunters were out hunting. I was walking alone minding my own business, when I see the man in the pig mask and he sees me. He now knows my face, and this becomes important later. I hear a deep laugh, and he turns his gun towards me. I have no idea what he was planning, but I book it out of their ASAP so I didn't have to figure it out. The third and final encounter was the most blood-curdling. It occurred only about a week ago, and I was walking home from my cousin's house in the dark. I had my flashlight shining, and I felt safe for once, but something was off. The barn lights were on. They are never on. No one ever goes into the barn, the floors are falling through, and I simply brushed it off as a technical error. But then in the middle of the field, I saw the man in the pig mask, and he saw me. And his words have haunted my dreams since he yelled at me, Get the hell out of here before I make you. The way he said it still frightens me. It was so angry, so vicious, and so dead set on revenge. I haven't been in the woods since then. It was later discovered that in the barn, they had been setting up shop from time to time. So in conclusion, 
I just want to leave a personal message. To my friend in the pig mask, let's never meet again. Especially not in my woods. At the time of this story, I was going through a bad breakup. Turns out that one of my best friends had been having an affair with my now ex-girlfriend. If this has happened to anyone, you know the feeling of being crushed, not only by your partner, but by your closest and most trusted friend. I have always been a bit of a loner, and so the few friends I had I cherished, and this was a truly crushing blow for me. I sort of lost it for a while. I just kind of went off the radar, packed all my things quietly one evening, drove to my parents' house, and broke down. It wasn't a pretty sight. I don't know how she could have done that to me. But whatever, that's in the past now. In an attempt to heal my very breaking and aching heart, I started taking long walks at night. It would give me time to think, and smoke, and just generally chill. I found it very hard sleeping, my mind always racing, so instead of fighting a losing battle, I just wore myself to the point where I would pass out at about 4am. It was better that way. But onto the story. There's these woods near my parents' house. As a kid, I never really went into them. Picked up some pretty creepy vibes from them before, but as an adult, with not much to lose, I felt like it was time to explore these creepy woods, and what better time than between 1 and 3 a.m., of course. I'd always have my phone on me as a flashlight, although the battery did drain quite quickly, but there was usually enough moonlight out so that I would be able to see my way through the woods. The canopy was by no means thick, and with the street lights dotted about in the distance, you could just about make out this trail. I'd been walking through the woods for about a month now, starting to feel better about my situation and coming to terms with the fact that an eight year relationship had come to an end, and that there are far better ways to spend my time than moping about all of this. That's when for the first time ever, I heard something. It sounded like footsteps. This was odd. After about a month of walking in the woods, I had never heard a single soul behind me this late at night. Chills ran down my spine, and something inside me told me that I didn't want to be seen. So I quietly turned off my flashlight and crept behind a tree. I sat down and listened. At first, the sound was muffled, but as it came closer, it was very clearly boots stomping their way forward, almost like a march. I peeked from my position on the tree, and what I saw gave me chills. There was a figure, they were wearing revolutionary style clothes, and they just marched on kind of illuminated by the moonlight, but definitely translucent. My eyes followed the grey spectral figure as it walked through the woods. It got to a point where it simply vanished. In the films, they make it that they become puffs of smoke or stuff like that, but this was not the case. The spectre was there one second, and then simply was not the next. Now, as someone who had been walking this trail for a month, and who genuinely couldn't sleep, I can assure you all I was not fatigued in imagining this. If anything, the adrenaline surging through me had caused me to become more awake than I had ever been, on one of these walks anyway. And I sat there, waiting, for about 20 minutes in case the figure showed up again. I slowly brushed the dead leaves off my butt and strode onwards towards the house. I got back home 
and now my mind was plagued with other thoughts. What the hell did I just see? I didn't sleep that night, and the next night, for the first time ever, I managed to get a good night's rest, as things had been put into perspective a little bit more. I'm almost grateful seeing that figure helped me get over a bad breakup. So, to the ghost who I saw that night, if you're out there, thank you for your service. Every summer, I go to this camp deep in Pennsylvania called French Creek Bible Camp. I was with the grade 11 to 12 age group. There's been many stories passed around over the years about evil creatures living in the woods. One was called the Goat Man. He was described to be like the devil himself, having red eyes. Some claimed to have seen him, but I did not believe them. There used to be five different sleeping areas at this camp, three for guys and two for girls. But a few years ago, Sleeping Area 5 burnt to the ground one night, while people were camping there. No one is sure how the fire started, because the cabins do not have electricity, and fire officials said it wasn't a forest fire that caused Unit 5 to burn. This was already strange enough. Now I was in Unit 4, the furthest away from civilization. One night, our cabin door swung wide open and crashed against the wall, as if someone kicked in our door. But we shined a flashlight outside and investigated, and saw nothing. We told some people the next morning, but we didn't think much of it. Keep in mind, the weather was not at all windy. Was this a sign we shouldn't be here? Now, this is where stuff got intense. It was the second to last night before we were supposed to go home. Once again, the weather was calm, it was around 2.30am, and my entire cabin was awoken to the loud sound of our wooden door being slammed open. Moments later, we hear a loud cracking noise, and I notice the large tree next to our cabin is falling towards us. I believe in the split second I looked out the window and at the tree falling, I saw a dark figure fleeing the area. The tree fell onto our cabin and crashed through the roof onto my cabin mate's bed. If I had not looked out the window, he would have been crushed by the weight of the tree, and or the ceiling falling. This tree was very large, at least a hundred feet tall, and everyone in the surrounding area came to see what happened, and made sure that we were all okay. We looked at the tree, and it was cut cleanly across the bottom, as if someone cut it with a chainsaw but we were so close to the tree that we would have heard someone sawing it, so that's impossible. I truly believe someone or something was trying to get rid of us or punish us that night. Needless to say, I had my mum take me home right away and have not been back since. I grew up in a small coastal Oregon town. Nothing ever happens, and it's always quiet. From my childhood home, you could look one direction and see nothing but ocean in the distance, and in the other, forest-covered mountains. You would hear stories from old people sitting around campfires after a few beers that had loosened their tongues about the stuff they'd seen on the ocean or out in the deep woods. Loggers would frequently tell about Sasquatch and footprints the size of a man's chest, or the howl that sounded like nothing else a seasoned hunter had ever heard. I was a hard kid, hard life, hard attitude. I trusted no one, didn't believe anything unless I saw it myself, and none of these tales really did anything for me other than give me a little chuckle. I was a pretty poor kid, and had nothing but hand-me-downs and government food and stuff, so I learned, like many folk in the area, to supplement our food by foraging and hunting. I was probably around 12 or so, and I was on foot after about a three-hour hike 
into old forest growth, with just my dog and I going up to our Chantelier mushroom patch to pick for the day. Being that deep was not uncommon for a boy my age, as that was just what you did. No big deal. I was deep enough that the only trails were made by deer and elk, and I only knew how to get there by following a trail of surveyor ribbon that I had left on branches of trees. Deep enough that the moss and brush ate up all the sounds, even your footsteps to the point a bird call would even echo like a siren. We were in the patch for a while, picking and stacking the mushrooms, just me and my rowdy German Shepherd slash wolf hybrid, and I had a good stack with no slug marts or mushy spots. Rowdy usually slept the whole time I picked, but this time he was pacing about. But I didn't pay much attention because sometimes he got a wild hair and just did stuff differently as his nature. All of a sudden, while I was picking, he ran up to me and whined like he did when he needed to pee in the mornings and began circling me. And that's when I felt it. You know the feeling when something is definitely watching you, but you can't tell from where or what it is? The hair on my neck stood up and my skin started tingling, and that flight reaction in my gut told me to run. But I didn't. I listened. I didn't hear anything except Rowdy whining for a few seconds, and went back to filling my pack. A bit quicker now, as I had seen cougar and bear feces in the area, and bears will eat mushrooms. By this time, Rowdy was visibly freaking out, and it was freaking me out, but I was determined to go home with my harvest. All of a sudden, Rowdy just took off and left me. He had never done such a thing. And then I heard a branch break behind me. Not a twig, a branch, and another. I ran as fast as a white boy alone in the woods could, and then the thing was pacing me. I could hear it off to my right and then behind me again to my left. I knew that there was a clearing up ahead where I could follow the power lines down and ran even harder. When I got to the clearing, Rowdy was there with his hackles raised and growling as he started barking and snarling like he could have a while back. Then it screamed. It wasn't an elk or coyote or anything I've ever heard before. And it was so loud and guttural and close, I screamed back out of pure fear and nearly pissed myself on the spot. The dog and I started running again, and I didn't hear it following this time. We made it home, and I told my parents, and they laughed at me for being a little wuss. Said it was probably an elk or something, and to stop being silly. So I dropped it and only told the few people that shared similar stories with me. We went back a few months later, and the whole patch had been rooted up, like an elk got to it, with their racks. So maybe it was just that. But I don't know. A few fraternity brothers and I were backpacking in Nantahala National Forest, and met some guys local guys, and I mean not local hangout bros, but local backwards, lived there for generations, hate the federal government, and society kind of people. Guys that had apparently been helping Eric Rudolph, the Olympic bomber, hide in the national forest by supplying him with food drops. Really weird drunken campfire conversations. They took us to one of their hideout slash drop off caves. They were too serious, and the whole reason they trusted us was because some things were said drunkenly to make them think that we were of a similar mindset to him and their world views. We parted ways and spent a few days trying to figure out if it was all rubbish. That same week, they catch Eric Rudolph in the dumpster of a Piggly Wiggly three miles away from where we met the guys and four miles from the cave that they would drop stuff off for him. 
Every single thing these guys said matched up with every single news story that was on the news. We even gave them a bottle of Jack, which they said they'd give to Eric. Creepy as hell. The drunken conversations I had with these two guys at 3am sitting in the middle of nowhere are hauntingly creepy and retrospective. I was camping on a reservation and walked up to the lake from the campground. It was a 20 minute walk to the lake. To the left, there was a destroyed and decaying elevated wooden path through a dead swamp. And to the right, the pipe from the water station at a lake. When we got to the lake, all the animal noises had stopped. The lake was tannin stained and pitch black. The trees were all burned or dead, and the dock was floating, not attached to anything. We went on the dock, and I stayed there while the other two went and took the crappy one oar rowboat out to the water. The whole time it was absolutely silent, and my gut was screaming danger. It took them a while to paddle back to the dock, but they were freaking out too. So we hightailed it out of there. And once we were halfway back, we left the silence and immediately heard birds. I took a few steps back and it was basically silence. First few steps forwards and birds. Not exactly a Bigfoot encounter I know, but creepy nonetheless. And there are Bigfoot sightings and reports around all the time I was there. It is said that if a Bigfoot is in the area, everything will go quiet because they are afraid of it, and know it's there. I think that's probably what happened. I was working in the Czech Republic, at kids' summer camps when I was 20. It was nothing like the American summer camps that I've seen on TV. It was far more relaxed. We owned a huge cabin in the forest just outside a small town. There were walking tracks around, and people could walk past our cabin and field area from time to time. One time, I was doing some craft with a small group of children at a table that can be seen from the walking tracks when this guy walks by. He's about 30, had dreadlocks, and is alone, wearing heavy boots, these patchwork pants, and a loose metal signet. He stops mid-walk when he spots us and begins to approach. He asks me in Czech if I have any cigarettes. I tell him that I don't speak Czech very well in an attempt for him to give up and leave. I'm trying to be nice because I have five kids here sitting at the table and I don't want to scare them. He then switches to English. It was like a 50-50 chance he wouldn't speak English in this part of the country and he begins commenting on my tattoos, as I have a sleeve. He's asking me all this stuff, saying he's getting a new one, asking about the cigarettes again, and I say no. I was being polite about the tattoos, but I'm not encouraging this conversation. He asks me my name, and I tell him, which keeps him talking for a bit, and after a while he moves on. I sigh with relief, and the day continues. Later that afternoon, it was around six. The light is still out, and we were killing time before dinner was being served. I was in the field outside the cabin, with some kids running around. Other leaders were doing various activities with kids, when all of a sudden another leader got my attention, and told me to get the kids inside. I look up on either side of the field where the trees start, and there are guys all dressed similarly to the guy earlier, standing just back from the tree line. They'd spread out in different angles, and then I hear someone shout my name. We move all the kids inside and lock the doors. The three male leaders we have go out to speak to the guys in the forest surrounding our cabin. I hear them say, we're here hunting for deer. Thought we saw it coming through this way. Anyway, I'm a friend of, and then he says my name. I start freaking out. I can't believe it's the same guy from the morning. He says, I want to show her my new tattoo. Confused, the leaders come back and are like, 
Who are these guys? They know I'm not Czech, and I don't know many people outside our circle, so I know it's odd. I tell them about the morning, and, and that I don't want to see him again. They go back out, and tell these guys to leave after some fuss and yelling. The rest of the trip, I was paranoid that they'd return, especially at night. Luckily for me, they didn't. After my family moved from South Mississippi, we spent maybe six months outside Batesville, but we moved to a city just outside of Charlotte. The house we bought, my parents purchased for probably one of the oddest reasons ever. The day we toured the home, the elderly lady that owned it was cooking pasta, and the house had filled with the smell of good homemade tomato sauce. My parents fell in love at that very instant. The house wasn't what you'd consider to be large, being one of those ranch-style homes that was popular in the 70s and 80s. Three bedrooms, two bathrooms, a concrete back patio, half a dozen pine trees of varying age, and a carport rounded out the home. The house itself was sat on maybe a quarter acre of land, kind of on a hill, with a crawl space. First things first, before we go any further, I have done some research into the property. Naturally, as I was 12 at the time and there was no internet, I didn't do it then. But when I started getting into paranormal investigations, I felt that it was a good time as any to look into some of the previous properties where I had experiences. As far as I can tell, the house itself had nothing overly spectacular that happened in it, while the property itself had been part of a subdivision that grew up there in a housing boom in the 70s, while the majority of the houses dated from around that era. There were one or two which were younger, and maybe a handful that were older. The only thing of note, even marginally so, was records of a Civil War Confederate army that passed through the area, but no real major battles there, perhaps a skirmish or two, but nothing substantial. Whatever the case, I couldn't tie any actual deaths to the property itself. Note, I mean the property the house stood on, not the subdivision. That's another story, but I'll get to that presently. When we first moved to the house, it didn't take long to notice some strangeness to it, Feelings of being watched were common, if not regular. There always seemed to be a presence, and one that didn't strike me as being very happy, tied to the living room area. Curiously, my parents would close the hallway door, which opened into the foyer and front door each and every night. That wasn't something they did previously, as any other house that had a similar setup. I never did figure out why they did that, though. Whatever the case, the feeling of being watched seemed to all center around the living room and the foyer area of the house. My first bedroom was directly adjacent to this, and I started sleeping with my own door closed then. I can't count how many times I would wake at night with the distinct feeling that something was watching me as I slept. Something that didn't want me or my family there. As far as I can remember though, I only ever had one full paranormal sighting, which is to say, I saw something that I can't explain. One Saturday morning while my dad was outside working on his truck in the patio, I sat in front of the TV in the living room watching my cartoons. As I sat there for some unknown reason, I look up at the door that connected to the hallway. I think I heard someone walking past, or maybe sensed something. In either case, as I looked up for a moment, I caught the shape of someone walking past the door. I didn't see a full body, but rather a hand in a long jacket with large brass buttons. It was as though someone was swinging their arms as they were walking, and their hand had remained visible for an instant before they walked into the hallway. The hand did not look normal though. Everything was grey. This soft, faded grey that you could kind of see through. 
Needless to say, I freaked out. I stood up, and without sparing a glance back, I darted off into the carport. My father asked me what happened, and I told him I'd seen someone, or thought I had seen someone walking down the hall. He gave me a funny look, checked the house, and told me to change and go out to play, as it was obvious to him that I'd been inside for far too long. The feelings of being watched never really stopped in the house. They kind of came and went after that, but the overall feeling that I got was that something just wasn't right about that place. Now, as I said, I can't tie anything to the house or property it was on itself, but the land the subdivision was on was another story. Further down from where I lived, there was this deep gully area with this old dirt road that ran into it, and then alongside the creek at the bottom. This area was rather popular among the few kids that lived in the area, with us cutting trails and building forts. One thing that always stood out about this area was at the bottom of the gully, the rusted remains of a wrecked car sat half in the gully and half out. I now know that it was a 1940s era car, but at the same time, all I knew was that it was old and it had been there a while. This car was something weird in its own right. Every kid that lived in the area had stories about it with the majority of them being that they didn't like standing near it. Where possible, they'd even go out of their way to avoid being close to it. Much like my house, things didn't really feel right there. But at the car wreck site, well, that feeling was jacked up to 11. Everyone had stories of seeing things in those trails too. With my then best friends, Rob and Riley, relating a story of how one day they were chased out of the trails by this weird old guy in overalls, carrying a pipe or something similar. They told me they saw the guy running after them, and once they passed the car, Rob looked back to see this old guy vanish into thin air. Other friends told of this weird girl in an old dress who would sometimes be seen walking along the trails like she was lost. When approached, she would just silently stare at someone before turning and walking deeper into the woods. Those that tried to follow her would end up turned around and usually pop out the trails back where they had started. So naturally, when I started researching my old home, I had to look into the old gully as well. While I didn't find anything substantial that would say, yup, this place is haunted, and here's why, I did turn up a good bit of circumstantial evidence. As with everything, you have to take evidence, especially circumstantial, with a grain of salt. But I do think that this answered some of the questions I had about the area. Granted, it still created more questions, but I'm at least happy with the results. As to the circumstantial evidence, I found that back in the 50s, the property had been largely uninhabited. I say largely, because there was something of an exception to this. On the back side of things, across from where the gully was, a house had stood. That home was owned by a family who had owned the property that would later become the subdivision. Most of where the subdivision was had been farmland, while the dirt road followed the curve of the road I lived on, before turning and going deeper into the gully area. The road has been cut at some prior point possibly in the 30s or so, to act as an access road to allow loggers to cull some of the pine trees in the area. However, by the 50s, it was largely out of use, save for a kind of make-out place by local kids. The area being well enough out of the city limits and quiet enough so people wouldn't be disturbed. Sometime around 1956 or 7, the house that owned the property burnt down under mysterious circumstances, killing the elderly man who owned the property. The cause of the fire had been arson, though they were never able to figure out who had done it. It is believed, however, that the fire had been started in retaliation for something that had happened a couple of years earlier. Several years earlier, the man who owned the property had found himself in court as a result of some actions he had taken. 
the record was rather vague on this. But it did note that in trying to scare some kids off his property, there had been an accident that resulted in the death of one young woman. Beyond that, it didn't say much. Whatever the case, the man managed to beat it and returned to his home. Then a few years later, his home burnt down with him inside it. After that, the property remained forgotten, ended up being broken up by several purchases before sometime in the 70s. A development company purchased it and started putting homes on it. What do I think happened there? I've got a couple of theories, but based on everything I remember seeing and knowing of the area, only one thing seems to be likely. Some time between 1950 and 1955, this man's property became a popular makeout place for local teens. This angers the man as the kids are making a nuisance of themselves, vandalizing his property and outbuildings, and just generally annoying him. So one night he takes things into his own hands. The cops really aren't doing much as he's outside the city limits and deputies are taking forever to show up when they show. So he decides that he's going to either confront the kids or at the very least give them a good scare. He happens upon some kids and starts chasing them in hopes of getting them off his property. When the driver makes a mistake and either hits a tree or simply rolls his car into the gully. This then kills the girl in the car, injures the boy and causes the man to be charged with being responsible for their deaths. However, he manages to beat the charge with the death being ruled accidental and he's not held responsible. The car remains where it's wrecked due to it being either too difficult to pull out or just not worth the trouble to recover. Someone tied to the kids, possibly the parents or the surviving kid himself takes the law into his own hands and sets the man's house on fire, killing him in the process. The police are pretty much tired of dealing with this guy or just don't look into it too hard and the killer goes unpunished. I think the theory pretty well explains at the very least the experiences we often had on those trails, with Robin Riley being chased off by the old man's ghost, repeating the same kind of thing he had been known for doing. The girl on the other hand was likely the spirit of the one killed in the accident. She may have been cursed to wander simply because the killer was never convicted. Whatever the case, the property is pretty much now gone. Since we lived there in 1986 to 89, the area has been built up further, with the gully area largely being filled in and developed into housing. I do wonder if the people that lived there see the spirits from time to time, but I don't have any real way to contact them without looking like some kind of crazy person. Well, now that I live over 3000 miles away. In the end, I suppose, this is one of those ghost stories that doesn't really have a good ending, or ever will. Oh, and as to the Batesville thing, well, Batesville Elementary slash High School used to be well known for a haunting in the gymnasium. The ghost in question was a young girl who was brutally assaulted and eventually killed there, with the case still open as her killer was never caught. It was said that from time to time, people would hear the sound of a girl screaming for help in the back corner of the gym near the bleachers. On inspection though, they wouldn't find anyone. I didn't ever experience the ghost myself, though as the murder happened about a year after my family moved. However, I am kind of tied to the story indirectly. The girl who was murdered? Her mother was a teacher who worked with my mum who was also a teacher. That girl also had a crush on me. So yeah, I knew her. Always kind of felt bad that I rebuffed her advances so much. But I thought she was a bit weird and just didn't like her. So that's that. This happened near a place we go camp and canoe in the summer, late one night. My fiance and I got a call from a good friend of ours and she needed us to retrieve a canoe of hers. The problem was, the canoe was sitting on a beach at the end of her road by some bushes, which were right behind her crazy brother's house. Previously, this psychopathic brother 
had threatened us with an axe when we went down to the beach to use the canoe, so we decided that it would be best to return under the cover of night. We parked at the top of the road, which is a very steep hill, and we slowly crept down so as to not set off the neighbor's motion-activated lights. My brother's house was right at the bottom of the hill, and he had been able to see us creeping along the woods if we were to light ourselves up. As we neared the bottom, we noticed a few lights still on in the brother's house, so we sat down in the middle of the road and lit up a cigarette each, waiting for him and his wife to go to bed. This road is in the middle of a private community, far out in the woods, so we had no expectations that anyone would be driving by, and sitting in the road besides the woods, no one nearby could see nor hear us. As we waited, we began to hear a loud rustling in the woods behind us. We watched, and in the deep darkness we saw a cat step out by the stone wall, right near the road we were sitting on. A large, wild cat. It was so dark we weren't sure what exactly it was, but the moment it saw us, it went from a loud approach to making absolutely no sound at all. By the time we had the balls to shine a light on it, it had somehow slinked back into the woods, far enough back that all we could see was the glare off its eyes, and it hid its body behind a fallen tree. We figured we scared it away. Eventually, Psycho Canoe Stealing Brother and his wife shut off their lights and are in bed. The fiancé and I creep the rest of the way down the road to the beach, and over to the area that's just behind this guy's house to retrieve the canoe. We notice he has a lot of windows open on his house, so we decide to smoke some cigarettes and wait a bit, so that he has time to drift off to sleep before we sneak the canoe back up to his sister's house. We think we hear something in the woods. Perhaps it's just our imaginations. We realize that nearly everything is silent. We're right by a lake, but there are no insects, no frogs, nothing making noise in the woods, and that's not normal. And I begin having this overwhelming feeling of being watched from the bushes that the canoe is inconveniently tucked just beneath. We've waited a while, and I needed to pee bad. I go over to the bushes, and as I get close, something runs right towards me and stops maybe 10 feet back in the bushes. We can't see anything. Frogs start screaming nearby, and the danger call goes all around the pond. We can hear crunching in the bushes the entire time. But as soon as the call stops, so does the crunching around us in the trees, by the bushes. This goes on for a while. Every time we're moving around or talking, we can hear something moving around us but the second we quiet down, it goes silent. Supposedly, there are no mountain lions in this area, but we see hunters posting videos from their trail cams regularly. At this time, we didn't think of this, but eventually we decide that we're being stalked by something, and it's better we don't shoulder an 100 pound canoe and try to hike up a steep hill, especially since I weigh about as much as the canoe, and would be easy pickings if I were hunted. We book it back to our car, all the while something is following us in the woods. Silent when we stop, but we can hear it out of sync with our steps when we're walking. We make it to the car, hop in, and back down the driveway full of adrenaline. Finally, feeling slightly safe after 45 minutes of sensing we were being followed, and off in a clearing of the woods through the ferns, we can see the eyes reflecting at us, maybe three or so feet off the ground. We have no confirmation of what it was, but it just confirmed that we had been followed from the time we smoked in the road until the time that we made it back to the car. I live in North Texas, near a large wildlife refuge, and a lake bigger than my hometown. One night, I had a fantastic idea to go down the long gravel road to a dock with a female friend of mine. I'm from Texas, 
so I usually carry, but opted to leave my gun locked in the glove box by the gate. About 30 yards into the trek, the road was about 200 yards to the dock, I hear an unnerving noise on my left. It was as if the earth itself growled and rumbled at me. I looked around frantically, trying to pinpoint the sound, but there was nothing. We stood still, waiting for it to resume. Instead, we hear just heavy footsteps, not crashing or rustling like a bear or a pig does, but heavy pacing. I turn to my friend and ask if she wants to go back. She didn't know but wanted to get out of there. So we kept on our journey to the dock with the unnatural growling slash rumbling following us, coupled with the heavy paces. I'm terrified at this point, instinctively reaching for my right hip to find a blank space where a holster should be. I had left it in the glove box. I grab my pocket knife and palm it aggressively. The rumbling continues, almost impacting the air with its weight. We hasten our pace, and it matches ours, but never coming out of the woods to show itself. This continues for about 300 yards. The entire time, I am absolutely terrified. I've been hunting and camping since I was six, and I've never heard a sound like this one, or even had an experience similar. Finally arriving to the dock, she sprints out to the edge and I grab a handful of rocks and go sit beside her. For the next 15 minutes, it circles the area around the dock landing, emanating the rumbles and growls. Nothing we can do. It's dark. We have no form of weaponry and we can't see. I call my buddy Dennis, who lives five minutes away. The rumbling and pacing continues roughly 30 to 40 yards away from us, but it doesn't step foot on the dock. Finally, I see headlights come up over the trees and the rumbling fades into the darkness. Dennis comes walking down cradling a rifle and that was the end of that. Really freaked me out for a few months. I am a believer in cryptozoology now. I don't know if Bigfoot exists, but something does that may be similar especially considering that most cultures have their monsters. After a heavy night of drinking and camping, we woke up and nobody wanted to make breakfast. So we decided to drive into town and find dinner. We're approaching where the dirt meets the pavement and come up on a dozen sheriffs blocking the road two of which have rifles pointed on us. We stop the truck about 40 feet from them and hear them yell over the bullhorn to stick our hands out the windows. They then instruct us to approach on foot with hands in the air. They search my truck and find it loaded with loads of guns and beer. That's when they tell us that a forest service agent has been shot nearby and passed. They eventually let us go but telling us our camping gear is forfeit until the guy is caught. We didn't want to leave our gear and go home, so we end up at a near casino and continued the party there. A few hours later, someone in the casino says that there are loads of cops outside. We go out and there must have been at least a hundred sheriffs, local PDs and every branch of law enforcement. Apparently the murderer had stopped at the casino gas station and an officer recognized him. The law enforcement officer drew his gun, the murderer went for his, and the murderer shot him dead. We went back to camp and then home the next day. I checked the newspaper article. They had a map of where the murder happened. It was a quarter of a mile down the road from our campsite. I have had several paranormal experiences in my life, and I consider myself somewhat sensitive to them. These experiences have sort of fallen on my lap, and I have never been one to search for anything beyond our current understanding of the world. My first incident happened when I was a kid. I was always a heavy sleeper, and would sleep through the night like a rock. 
even through some of the worst thunderstorms. One night, however, I awoke in the middle of the night, wide awake. I look around, and in my room there is a soft yellow glow of my Batman nightlight peering through my bunk bed ladder. I look to the right, and remember seeing the closet door open, and I always kept it shut, and a cobra-looking snake off to the side of the middle of the floor. I leaned up and sat on my bed fixated on it, but then remembered what it was. It was my toy set, and I could start to see the mountain that was made to resemble a snake. Once I caught a glimpse of my own trickery, I felt a looming presence beneath me. I had an odd sensation stream through me that there was something under my bed, so I became frightened, and did what any rational kid would do in this situation. I crept closer to my nightlight, like the light would save me from whatever was underneath me, and as I moved closer, there was something inside of me that kept saying, Look under. Look underneath. I inched myself over the edge, and as I came close to the precipice of seeing underneath, I heard the most demonic menacing growl I've ever heard still to this day. I shot back as quick as a spooked shrimp, and shielded myself with my blanket. Petrified, I started rationalizing everything. Joey, is that you? I said this shakily, hoping it was my uncle who loved to pick on me. Joey? I chimed again, hoping it was him. The same indistinct feeling told me to look over the bed. Look behind you. I peered the blanket over my head, looked behind me, and saw a ghoulish hand creep over the back end of my bed. Then everything went black. The house I primarily grew up in was built by us, and for us, on what was rumoured to be a Native American lookout, which I came to find out through my dad later in life. Just a few miles away from the mound builders in Heath, Ohio, USA. All of my events in that house would come and go with streaks of consistency, to long periods of nothing. But when something happened, you knew it was happening. I slept with a light on in my room, until I had my own TV. But the next time anything off happened to me, I was in middle school. Right around the age of, you're old enough to be home alone. And during this time, I saw a lot of death in my family. And my parents were going through the later stages before their divorce. I'd had odd dreams and reoccurring nightmares every once in a while about my basement, but I chalked it off to, oh, it's a basement and they're supposed to be inherently creepy, so I thought nothing of it. Every once in a while, I'd be home in my room, and my sister, who is my only other sibling, would be offered a friend's or doing sports. I'd hear the garage door open and think, oh, dad's home and continued playing my game. Then I'd leave my sanctuary to go get food or water, and hear the TV downstairs playing Star Wars, and the sounds of toys being boxed and taped up. My dad and I were in the collectible toy business, before it hit its most recent downfall as of here recently. I'd open the basement door and see if he needed a hand, and as I'd open the door, all the sounds dissipate, and all I see is black down the steps. I'd check the garage to see if anyone even came home, to find it empty. I'd find out later the same thing would happen to my sister, and even my dad. The same thing, but vice versa. If I was downstairs, garage noises would happen. I'd hear the sounds of my mom's van, her footsteps, and the jingle of her keys, only to go upstairs to an empty house. My mom, Catholic raised, was the only one in the house to never openly admit 
to seeing or hearing anything. My dad, who's a little more out there, would have the noise experiences, chronologically to this story, and he told me of the time that our dog Lola stared into my sister and I's part of the house slash bathroom. She apparently was growling and barking in that direction for about half an hour, until he decided to get out of the kitchen to look. He saw nothing. But as he got closer, Lola immediately stopped barking, as if he scared whatever it was away. My sister would always feel uncomfortable in the house, and especially in her room. Her room would always be the coldest in the entire house, which made little sense, because her room faced the southern sky, with no cover from the sun unless it was a cloudy day. She told me that around the age of the aforementioned night, she'd feel like something weird was happening in my room, and would see a strange green glow. The next time anything weird happened, besides the noises and dreams, I would be in high school at this point. My mum had claimed a glass cabinet with a mirror on the inside from my great grandma who was dear to us. However, the cabinet didn't feel dear and was stuck in the basement. I would spend most of my time downstairs and have my own setup because my friends came over a lot. This was the time of the 360, and rock band was a hit. I would sing and play the guitar, and it was a blast. One day, I was jamming. I felt a weird chill go down my spine. Something was in the corner of the room where the cabinet was. I paused the game, looked out of the corner of my eye. The cabinet at this point was about six feet away from me. As I looked, I saw my reflection twist its head with a menacing smile, and start to twist out the chair and creep closer. I dropped the plastic guitar, ran upstairs and out the back door. I waited until my mum got home before I went back inside. A few months passed before I felt safe to be downstairs alone, and eventually things evened out, but still to this day I don't trust the cabinet. The next things I would encounter after the cabinet became more absurd and extraterrestrial. Although, while that was going on, there was a white house two houses down to the left that kept giving me ominous vibes. Doors Arboretum eventually bought the property, and here recently demolished the house. I think it's also a good time to mention that the road I live on has had five tragedies of people taking their own lives, and the church on the road has always been rumoured to be a front for satanic worship. Also, the Boeing company has a high security facility not 10 minutes away from my house. The company works with the Air Force and makes equipment for them. I know this is about to get bizarre, and it's getting to a point of, this guy's a quack, but I have nothing to gain from sharing this, besides a sound mind. My girlfriend at the time and I would spend a lot of time together. We were each other's rocks, and had all the makings of high school sweethearts. One night after drama practice, she drove me home as she normally did, as I did not have a car. We made our way up the hill to my house, and waited for my mum who was running late. It was tax season, and that's her job. Eventually, we heard the garage door open, and looked to the left to see a car coming up the driveway over the first hill. My driveway is easily 400 meters long, and from Google Maps, they made it its own road. Once you go past that first hill, there's no real going back. I grabbed my things, kissed her goodbye, and looked to the garage to see the door was still closed. What? That's weird, my girlfriend said. We then looked down my driveway, and didn't see the car lights anymore, nor their rear lights. Then out of nowhere, her car shuts off. Lights, engine, everything. No key turn, no emergency lights, it's like the entire car was drained of everything. She called her dad, 
to have him come and see what was wrong, because her dad is a mechanic. My mum finally made her way home, and the moment she opened the garage door, my girlfriend's car started up again. A week later, my girlfriend was over, and my mum had to go to the store and get groceries. My dogs, Max and Lily, began barking and going crazy. Then, there was a weird humming noise going through the house, and you can feel the vibrations through it as well. Now my house is surrounded by corn and soybean fields. I checked outside through the window to see no farming equipment, but three evenly parallel dots above the tree line to the west of the house. They blinked three times and everything stopped. The noise, the vibration, the dogs, all of it. Then after a good amount of time, I went to Hocking College, and my girlfriend went to OU. If anyone knows anything about the hills and Athens, they're supposed to be haunted as hell. One day while I was visiting her, she had to grab something from one of her friends in a separate dorm. We get ready and travel over. I walk to the dorm and start to not be able to breathe, like it's restrained, not entirely suffocating but close. As we go up the steps, my neck starts to feel tight, and I tell her what's going on, to which she replies, Oh, a kid hung himself and ended his own life there three days ago. As with the rest of my stories, I immediately leave the building and wait for her outside the dorm. A good while would pass before my next event took place. I woke up late for my culinary practice exam. When it got foggy in the hills, it got foggy. But this fog was so thick that I could barely see in front of me. I walked to my class because I still lacked a car. I was also in the classic, I don't know my religion phase in college at the time. So I was meandering my way through the fog when I heard the sound of two birds and could see their tiny black silhouettes through the fog. I followed them as they led me through the path to the culinary building. But when I got there, they perched themselves upon the top and looked at me. I knew what they were and who sent them. Hugging and Munin, and Odin was watching me, which transformed my religious standpoint. Later in my years at college on my 21st birthday, I woke up in the middle of the night with sleep paralysis. The apartment that my ex and I had, had a light that would gleam through our window. This night, the soft light changed to an off-red. To the left of me, down a ways, was where our washer and dryer were, but the entire area was pitch black. I could feel a presence there that was definitely malicious, and not okay, just gleaming at me and smiling. The next day, I woke up and told my ex all about it. We had plans to go to Columbus, to an Irish bar called Fado, for my first legal Guinness. I ended up getting sick out of the blue halfway through our trip, and we ended up just going back home and continuing my day sick. My other Athens experience was when I went to the infamous Ridges. At this point in my life, my ex and I broke up, and I was on a wave of self-destructive behaviours. My friends from college were still in and going, and I was out and free. I dropped by every so often, and on this occasion, we decided to go at a night and walk through ridges. The majority of the group was the typical, let's get high and walk through the woods. But Mary and I never danced to the same beat, so I refrained. Our objective was the unmarked gravesite near the new compost building. We made our trek there, A-OK, -okay. nothing odd or weird. The moment we got to the graves, things changed for me. They were hanging around, taunting the area, saying hi to spirits, and they started their dance with Mary. Then I heard, Hey, get off. Come from the woods near us to the left. I asked them if they heard that. They claimed that I was just trying to mess with them. I looked over at the group, 
and one of them was standing on a tombstone that lay flat on the ground. So I quickly told them to get off and scolded them. As our time there grew, my feeling of uneasiness did as well, and I was able to eventually get everyone to head back. When we were heading back, I started to see a woman in white gowns shift and dissipate between the gaps in the trees. I started booking it out of there, and eventually we all headed back. If anyone who's hearing this has ever been to Nelsonville, Ohio for any reason, you'd know it as a one horse town with a giant cross on a hill. The town has become primarily dry because the two to three churches in the town have almost all purchased the available liquor licenses for the town. But there is a bar that still stands today that holds ties with the true history of the town, and it's called The Mine right next to the Rhapsody, which I spent a lot of time working for, not only class but being paid. One night at the mine, two of my friends and I were out back on their patio having a drink. This random woman came and sat down at our table out of the blue. You guys are young, I'm a psychic, and if you'd like, I could give you all a free reading. Obviously curious, we all accepted. My old friend since kindergarten went first. I see an odd change happening soon. Your mischievous spirit will help guide you, but your nomadic ways could get in the way. You're going to get an opportunity soon in love that you have to take. This hit the nail on the head, but we were all weary because of the people reading and vagueness that gets referred to psychics. My second friend was next. You're broken, not your body, but your heart. There's a loved one who left and doesn't feel the same. What's her name? My friend replied the name. Oh, she's going through transformations right now and will eventually settle down, but there's someone else. I'm sorry. This was also spot on, but also very, very vague. Then it was my turn. She helps my hand and her face went into a confused contortion. You're strong, not physically, but spiritually. There's an old love, but it's a dying flame. You're going to see a lot of battles ahead of you, sword and shield. And then she let go of my hand and shook her head and said, I don't trust you. She stood up and walked away. We never saw her again from any of our recurring visits to mine. A good amount of time would pass until my next experience. At this point in my life, I stayed more at home and went to my friend's apartment, which eventually would become my own. We'd be outside on the back patio and engage in the most binge drinking game of them all, Ring of Fire. Towards the beginning of the fall, my two friends living there started feeling something else in the house with them. On one of the nights, I saw a little boy with dark hair running through the kitchen out of the corner of my eye from outside, and we all heard a door slam in the apartment. I stopped what I was doing to investigate. The front door was locked, and no one else was home, but the basement door had been closed, and was opened. The airflow of this apartment is always shaky, and closing open doors all the time. I brushed off the closed basement door, but still felt like I needed to check it out. I went downstairs and turned on all the lights, and was looking around and trying to see what was up. Then I became fixated on this old nutcracker that the third roommate had. It just seemed different than all the other ones she had standing in rows downstairs. However, by the time she packed all her things up and I moved in, the little boy and the feeling of something there went away with her. The last experience I've had happened more recently and about a month ago. The place I work at is the Granville Inn right across the street from the Buxton Witch, which is presumably really haunted. However, our building is supposedly haunted as well. Old buildings tend to have the trend of old bones and memories. It was at the end of the month, 
and in my line of work that means inventory time. At the basement level, we have a room called the Wales Room, which is a place for private events. The room is notorious for flashing light bulbs and for the bulbs to die quickly. This could be just bad wiring from the rushed renovations the building experienced recently. I needed to inventory our personal logo water bottle storage right outside the exit doors through the room. Immediately I felt a cold chill behind me, and looked into an open door that led to an abandoned storage room. Inside the room was a mirror propped into a corner facing the opening. Through my experience with mirrors, I quickly counted the water bottles and got the hell out of that area, and her eyes lit up. Apparently, one of our old FOH managers saw a man with an old time outfit and hat walking down the hall to the Wales room. Thinking it was a lost guest, he followed the man around the corner to find out he wasn't there nor was there any sign or noise of anyone leaving through any of the doors. I hope my encounters have striked some sort of interest with you all. Like I said earlier, it's just so that I feel more sound and to put it out there. Thank you for your time. When I was 11, I went tent camping with teenage cousins on the Sioux Reservation, as they lived there. We were in an area we had followed several trails to find. We were inside the tent, and they were telling me a story about shapeshifters as the sun was going down. Suddenly there was a beautiful glow, like when the sun bursts out through the clouds and makes everything golden. It highlighted shapes going by the tent and casting shadows, and started as a nice experience. Then there was a loud boom, and the shadow of a large bird came right at us, and the tent fell down on top of us. They were genuinely scared, which made me even more terrified. We hightailed it back through those trails, and went home in the dark, barely able to breathe. We were going so fast. I still don't know what happened or why, but I can tell you I don't go tent camping anymore. I am an avid outdoorsman in Eastern Canada. I have seen some strange things out in the bush, and I will share them with you today. I live in New Brunswick, and for those wondering, it's right above the state of Maine. Every June, my friends and I will take a deep trip into the Appalachian Mountains for a few weeks, just set up camp and enjoy the few weeks until we return to busy life in the city. I am by no means a novice outdoorsman, so I know what to bring and to definitely bring a gun. I never go into the woods without a firearm, because you never know. Boy, am I sure glad I brought it. The day finally came for our trip. We all met at a local Tim Hortons and made the journey to the car lot to store our cars for the next few weeks we would be gone. After arriving at the lot, we unloaded and made sure we had all the right gear for the trip. Food, water, fire making supplies and firearms. The place where we would be camping is about a five to seven hour hike into the deep forest, far away from civilization. The hike to the camp was uneventful, but after the six-ish hours of leg workout we finally got, we then set up our tents. The first night was a typical night, full of drinking and playing card games. After about five hours of that, at around 10pm, we all went to bed. I woke up at 2am still a little tipsy from our party, and a couple of hours before, and went outside to take a leak. I stumbled out drunkenly, and found a good tree about 15 yards away from the tent. Midstream, I hear this whooping sound, almost sounded like a juggalo concert to be honest. It caught me off guard, I'd never heard anything like it. It scared me even in my drunken state, 
and I hustled back to the tent as quickly as I could to wake up my buddies. I shook them awake, and they were starting to tell me that they were still drunk and confused, asking me who the hell I am for waking them up. I proceeded to tell them that I heard a weird sound and told them to help me check it out. They basically all told me to piss off. I wasn't very happy by this, so I grabbed my gun and went out and fired a few rounds to scare off whatever was making that sound, and hoping that my buddies would use this cue to come out to see what was wrong. After unloading those few rounds, the whooping stopped. I stayed up for a few more hours before passing out from sheer exhaustion. The next morning, we all barely remembered that night we were so wasted. Being sober now, we all talked about it and what I heard last night. No one could explain what the sound was or the cause of it. The day went smooth and nothing out of the ordinary happened. The next night is what really did it for us. After about 9.30, we were sitting around the fire when we smelt this horrific smell. The only way I can describe it is if you were to mix piss, shit, and vomit together and multiply that by a hundred. We all looked at each other, trying to figure out what the origin of this awful smell could be. It lingered for about 10 minutes and then went away. We couldn't explain it. None of us farted or anything, so we had no idea what it could be. Soon after that, we could hear leaves being crunched and twigs snapping. To us, this was no big deal. The forest can make all sorts of scary noises, so we ignored it. The time came for bed, so we all crawled into the tent to doze off. Maybe 20 minutes after going to bed, we felt and heard something hit the tent. We all immediately sprung out of our sleeping bags and reassuring each other what we just witnessed. Was someone messing with us? We grabbed our guns, loaded them and quietly snuck out, pointing them in every direction and calling out, Hello? Who's there? Show yourself. There was no response. I called out again a bit louder this time, when all of a sudden we got pelted with rocks and things being thrown at us. We fired our weapons into the air and it stopped all of a sudden. We were all frantically looking around, scanning the forest for any possible movement, but there was none. That stench came back. We fired more rounds off this time into the trees and the whooping started again. It was closer. Whatever it was, we didn't want to find out. By this time, we were all basically crapping ourselves due to pure fear. We had never experienced anything like that. I saw some movement in the distance, finally, to which, after spotting, I yelled at it and fired. This strange scream or roar blared our eardrums. It was sort of like a sound that if you were to combine a hyena and lion would make. It lasted for only a few seconds, and the sound of branches being broken and leaves getting stomped on faded away into the distance. We stayed up the entire night and headed out at dawn. Whatever it was, I am positive it was some kind of Bigfoot. I am also 100% sure that I hit it with my shot. I never saw its features, so I could never really identify it. But I will forever wonder what that thing was that night that scared us to the bone. Needless to say, we will not be returning to that spot again. We camped on a remote beach in Northern Australia on an Aboriginal reserve as we had special permits. When we woke up in the morning, we noticed a huge tail drag and footprints where a croc had walked by our tent during the night. The croc was on the other side of the bay. That is of course, assuming it's the same one and must have been at least six meters long. As you can imagine, we made haste packing up all our things 
and moving the hell away from there. I've had several Bigfoot encounters within the city limits of Tampa, Florida. I know it sounds unbelievable. I've lived near the Hillsborough River, and after my encounter, I looked at my area on Google Maps. To my surprise, there is a lot of wooded area along the river leading out of the city. For about two weeks straight, I felt like I was being watched and stalked. Monday through Friday, I left my studio apartment at 5am to catch the bus to work. I walk to the bus, and it is on an extremely dark road that is alongside the river, where the entrance to my apartment complex intersects with this road that's wooded, if you know Florida forests. Then you know it can be quite intimidating, because the forests are very dense. I walk left from my community onto the only sidewalk. Across the street is the waterfront to the river with thick vegetation. I walk about a quarter of a mile before there is a house on the riverside on the street. On the left, I do walk past two fenced in apartment communities. I wanted to give you an idea of the terrain. When I felt like I was being stalked, I took off my Bluetooth headphones to listen. I heard the occasional twig snapping, and this reassured me that my spidey senses were correct. This continued for two weeks. I was a nervous wreck. I had been listening to Bigfoot encounters on YouTube for a while. I was learning all that I could about them, but I never thought that I could be stalked by one in Tampa. Until Monday, on the third week, I felt like I was being stalked. As soon as I turned left onto the sidewalk from my complex, do I hear a loud rock clacking? I don't listen to my headphones in the morning anymore. I pretended to be listening to them. And when I heard the rocks striking each other, my heart skipped a beat. Then I heard a familiar Bigfoot yell that I heard from a YouTube video. By this time, my heart was pounding. I almost crapped myself. I almost turned around, but stopped myself. I wanted to run so badly. Somehow I was able to barely flinch. I kept my stride, acting like I didn't hear a thing. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. As if what happened wasn't enough, I literally felt a rock land behind me. It must have had some considerable weight to it, because I felt the impact through my shoes. I was terrified. I thought I might not make it to the bus stop. Reflecting back on the encounter, I believe there was more than one during this. There might have been a juvenile there as well. They get aggressive when people get too close to their offspring. And the next morning about the same time, I could hear it having a massive temper tantrum. It was letting out the loudest and longest yells I've ever heard. I can only imagine how homeowners felt. And after that, I couldn't walk that way anymore, and had to take a different route to work. Which meant I had to catch the bus an hour and a half earlier. Every once in a while I would walk that way, to get some smokes from the gas station at around 10pm. I'd bring my pitbull, and we would both hear the occasional twigs snapping. She kept a constant eye over by the river. Sometimes it looked like she was staring at a thing, and wouldn't budge. She's an extremely protective and fearless dog, and has never backed down from anyone, other than thunderstorms, or Bigfoots. My whole family, of about nine people, went for a drive to my grandfather's favourite mountain. He recently passed, and we took my grandma because she wanted to go. It was a caravan of two trucks, on a muddy dirt road, near the top of a mountain. We stop, and get out to look at the view from the top of the ridge. I'm about six years old, and the youngest in the group. Everyone makes it to the top before I'm even halfway there, and they stare in silence. My brother breaks the silence by saying, Hey, as he scoops me up before I can reach the top and see the view. He carries me back down to the truck. 
everyone is murmuring and taking pictures, and I'm whining about never being able to do anything fun. I found out what happened about 15 years later. The photos from the trip were in a family album. I asked them about the mountain and the view I wasn't allowed to see. My mum explained that once they reached the top of the ridge, they saw a steep mountain slide covered in these large, perfectly black circles, as though the grass had been burnt. That's why they were shocked. I had a lot of anxiety as a kid, and I was terrified of natural disasters and stuff. My older brother knew this, and stepped in and directed my attention elsewhere so that I wouldn't flip out, while the other adults took pictures. My brother was the best. The pictures of the circles came out black or blank when they developed them. No one had a picture that showed the perfect black circles, yet all the other pictures were fine. This first story takes place in the Chuska Mountains in the 80s. My friend was about six years old and was up in the mountains for a family reunion at the family cabin. The cabin is in a meadow with a stone well near the tree line. They spent the day doing typical reunion things like three-legged races, flag football and whatnot. The sun starts setting and the families retire to the cabin and call it a day. The older people planned to sleep in the two bedrooms and the kids would sleep on beds slash cots set up in the living room. All was well, and the kids were tucked into bed. My friend Sandra is uneasy and is reluctant to go to sleep. She is wide awake and everyone falls asleep. Sandra tosses and turns, unable to shake her strange feeling when suddenly her feeling turns immediately to fear, as she hears something big, something heavy, making its way across the porch. Sandra fears that it may be a bear looking for food. Little did she know, it would be much worse. She could make up the shadow of something large and dark as it passes the window. It is making its way to the door, and she sees that the family don't lock the door, she is watching it, too scared to move or scream, and she sees the doorknob rattle back and forth. Whatever is trying to open the door, succeeds, and the room floods with the most putrid stench, and she sees a large human hand make its way through the door. Sandra finally summons her strength and screams, Dad! Her father runs in and sees Sandra pointing at the door. He sees the hands and runs to the door and yells, Hank, grab the gun. Whatever was at the door, runs. It was a full moon and in the moonlight they see the creature run across the yard. Hank, with a hunting rifle in hand, looks through the scope and sees the creature crouching behind the well. Sandra's father assumes it's a bear and tells Hank to shoot. Hank pulls the trigger and hears the bullet ricochet off the well. All thought of this being a bear is diminished instantly, when the creature stands up on two feet and runs towards the tree line. They never saw the creature again. I used to do a ton of camping, but one night still early on, I was up with two friends in the middle of the night, just hanging out in a field next to the campsite, looking at the stars and the almost full moon. It was so bright outside, it was almost like day, when suddenly I noticed a faint whisper. I thought it was someone from camp, but no, it came from the other direction. We all shut up and listened to the faint, hey, to which we follow. We crossed the field away from camp, as the whisper grew louder, but only ever so slightly, until we come across a road. Across the road was a fenced-in area, but it was a pretty crappy fence that was easily crossed. On the other side of the fences was a small woods. The trees were spaced pretty far apart from each other, despite the bright moon. It was completely pitch black in those trees, 
and you could barely see past the first few rows. And now the voice was much louder, but still as if someone was trying to whisper. A voice that sounded like a little girl. Come play. No women were there with us on this trip. No girls, just the sounds of little girls calling out to us in the pitch darkness to play at one in the morning. We decided not to investigate this any further. I went out to a forest with my uncle one evening. We were going to go night hunting, but it got cut short due to what we witnessed. We were just there for deer. An hour or so passed, and it was getting quite dark in the woods. While we were making our way around the woods, I heard a grunting noise nearby. It creeped me up for a second, and my uncle suggested it was probably just a wild boar. I turned around with my flashlight to see if there were any signs of nearby boar. What my light fell upon horrified me. The light from my flashlight fell upon an eye of a huge tall creature which appeared to be squatting. I grabbed my uncle's arm as I was scared as hell. My uncle told me to stay back, and we slowly backed away. The creature also backed away. I genuinely believe I saw a Sasquatch that night. I grew up in very rural Arkansas. I once stayed in a tent in the backyard with a friend when we were about 12. I had a dog named Shadow that stayed outside, and she was the bestest girl. My backyard butted up against hundreds of acres of woods, so coyotes and bobcats were pretty common but never came into the property because of Shadow. That night, as we stayed in the tent reading scary stories and talking girl talk, we heard what sounded like a woman screaming not that far away. I froze because my dad had told me that mountain lions sounded exactly like that. I wasn't even sure we'd make it back to my back door if we ran for it. My friend was terrified and thought a woman needed help, and I was trying to tell her that we had no neighbours for miles. And at that moment, Shadow started growling just outside the tent. I've probably never been so terrified before or since. She started barking and moving away from the tent in one direction, and that's when my dad threw open the back door and did one of those high-pitched dad whistles and ran towards the tent, yelling at us to get out, pistol in hand. We ended up sleeping inside that night. A few weeks later when we were heading down the gravel mine for target practice, a massive pit in the ground about a half mile away from home, we saw a mountain lion on the other side, and Dad murmured to me that it must be my friend. It was massive and terrifying and beautiful, and I have never seen another one in person since. A long time ago, I worked from a high security prison facility that was very isolated and covered by woods. I didn't work here long, but there were a few times when I would chat with inmates and they'd tell me stories of the things that they would hear in the night. Sometimes they would hear the sounds of crashing in the woods, the equivalent of a bulldozer pulverizing trees with no mercy on its endless pursuit of who knows what. Some nights they wouldn't be able to sleep, and when they'd report it to the guard, the guard would be just as scared, but at least they were inside and not out there. There'd be times where they would hear howls in the night, almost unfathomable sounds that they couldn't think could be created by either man or known animal. Safe to say, the prisoners were quite scared to be there. It only took a few weeks before I heard something myself. I was outside having a smoke break, when out of nowhere, this howl 
emerges from the forest. It's a sound the likes of which I've never heard. I found it utterly terrifying. I still don't know what could make that sound, but I have been told that elk make some pretty funky noises. But after listening to some recordings, it definitely wasn't that. It was way, way scarier. It's not like that sound is something you'd forget. In any case, after about two months of working there, the spooky vibes took control and I chose to leave. Best decision I ever made. About 11 years ago when I was 16, my family and friends went on an ATV trip to the North Woods in Wisconsin, somewhere in Iron Country. We went on yearly trips where we would ride all day, but head back to the same camp at night. This particular trip was our first time in the area, so we found a good looking campsite and made camp, then went riding. The trails in this area were not all too exciting, gravel logging roads that stretched miles with no one on them. So we cut the day short heading back to camp and deciding we would pack up camp and move next morning to a campground with better trails. Night came and my dad and stepmom slept in a small cabin, while my two friends, stepbrother and I slept in a tent. It had been dark for a while and we weren't getting any sleep, so we decided to take a walk around the campsite. The campground was almost at capacity, but no one was out at the fires, and it seemed like everyone was asleep. We walked the entire campground, and were almost back to our tent, and we decided to stop and stare at the stars. We are from the Chicago land area and have a lot of light pollution, so the stars that far north are very impressive. As we sat there pointing at the stars and constellations with our low quality flashlights, I noticed a satellite slowly moving across the sky. It was moving in a straight path across the sky, and I pointed it out and followed it with a flashlight until everyone saw it. It reached the center of the sky with its path when suddenly a large white light illuminated myself and the other three. We stood there, staring up at the sky in awe of what was happening. I don't remember any of us talking or questioning the light, and I also can't tell you exactly how much time passed underneath it. When the light stopped shining, all our eyes were still facing the sky, and we saw the same satellite dart across the sky in the same path. Stress on the word dart as the object moved about 10 times faster than before when I first noticed it. All four of us looked at each other shocked at what had just happened, and I immediately went back to camp. We talked about what it could have been, and what could have happened, but never came to any conclusion other than it being a UFO. The next day we told my parents about the encounter, and moved to a new campsite, and business as usual. For a few years I completely forgot about the event, which is strange in its own sense. However, to this day, all four of us remember the strange encounter with the bright light. This is a second-hand story that's been told to me by long-time legit cowboys, but is also corroborated with a newspaper story. In the southeastern High Sierra, there is a river called the South Fork of the Kern, and it's a good sized river. The Pacific Crest Trail crosses the river on a huge metal footbridge that must be repaired by Forest Service personnel every few years. One time during repairs, the men were interrupted by a horrendously loud bellowing scream. They turned to look towards the scream and supposedly right there was a freaking Bigfoot in all his glory. The men were armed, and they supposedly shot at it, but it didn't do much as they booked it out of there and never returned. I've been on this bridge many times, and have camped in the area all my life, as well as with my father. One time about 10 years after the bridge event, 
my dad was camping in the area with his friend. One night, my dad was awoken by something walking around the tent. Now for context, that tent is about eight foot tall in the middle. My dad says something pushed down on the top of the tent, directly down, and then walked off. He tried to wake his buddy up, but he slept through it. I'm not saying it was a Bigfoot, but with those events being so close, I don't know, man. It scares me a little. I have gone on a yearly spring turkey hunting trip for the past seven years. I couldn't go this past year due to joining the military. Around my third year in, my dad and I left to go fishing one day, leaving my dad's best friend and his father-in-law back at camp. When we returned, there was another fellow back at camp, not really all that uncommon as we camp right along the Appalachian Trail. Well, we got back there and figured that they had made a friend. I sat at the campfire with the guy and the father-in-law, while my dad and his best friend go get firewood. Now we're a really friendly group, and this guy wants to make camp. We politely say no, and that there isn't any room at our spot. He leaves and goes to make camp right down the road, where there are more spots. When my dad and his best friend get back, they load up all the guns and call the state troopers. I get handed a gun, and I'm told to be wary. I'm not sure what's going on. I just comply until I'm told the story. Turns out the guy was wanted for murder, self-admitted, who would hike the trail all the way up to New England with virtually no gear. When asked if he was carrying a weapon, he trailed off and didn't give a full answer. When I was out fishing, the guy said he needed to change and dropped toe in front of the two of us that stayed behind. That was the first time in the 25 plus years the trip had been going on that any of the guns were loaded at the campsite. There was this one encounter I had that really stands out among everything that's happened to me. I was hiking the ridges above Raton. I'd been out quite a while when I came across a well picked over deer carcass. There weren't any fresh tracks around it, but that's a real clear identification that I'm on some large predator's home turf. Time to go. As I'm climbing down the ridge, not the way I came up, mind you, I see a flat area with an old round stone formation. Think Stonehenge, but the rocks aren't squared off. Each of the rocks are taller than I am, and formed a darn near perfect circle. I'm a little creeped out, but I step in for a closer look. The second I crossed through the rocks, it was like an electric shock. Immediate goosebumps. The hair on my neck is standing up, and every nerve in my body is screaming at me to be somewhere else right now. I scrambled down the rest of the ridge, way out of control. I was lucky not to hurt myself at some point, because I was just jumping without looking where I was going, and I didn't look back once. Twenty years on, I still can't explain my reaction. I have not given to extreme flights of fancy. I'm not afraid of things that go bump in the night, and I'm not religious and don't believe in evil with a capital E. But I did that day. Something horrific happened there once, and it will happen again. Stay out of the woods.